Hello, everyone, and welcome to PTBFC. I'm Graham Marshman, here with my co-host, Louis Pasquale, and we have a very special episode for you today. Starting off with our special guest this episode, Joey Nardone. Joey is one of the station managers at WSOU, our college radio station, and one of our members here at PTV. Now, moving away from Joey, we love you, Joey, but we're going to move away from you right now. The Premier League has some many great games, including the Merseyside Derby and two London Derbies this weekend, and other fixtures that brought a lot of light to these teams along it that brought a lot, a lot of light to these teams in all of this so boys before we get started how are we doing today i am doing really good i'm happy to have a special guest for a few weeks behind schedule here but eventually we got it done every tuesday or every monday and wednesday i have class with joey and i was like all right joey this is the week this is the week but this finally is the week uh happy to have him on and talking some Premier league soccer as well as some other leagues perhaps towards the end of this episode Ooh, a little hint there joey how are we doing I'm doing great. Really appreciate you guys having me on. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'll be talking some wacky soccer, but I'm always down to chop it up at some Premier League as well. So it's going to be a fun time. All right. Well, starting us off with the Premier League, we're going to talk about Liverpool 2, Everton 0. During this game, you know, it was a very one-sided affair. It seemed like, you know, red card was given to Everton in the second half. And maybe Kanate should have been sent off. But now Everton find themselves in 16th place with three, paint, three put points away from relegation, is it finally ever time, Everton's time to drop after all these years of barely staying up in the Premier League? I'll take this one first, and I know what you're going to say, Graham. You're going to say yes unequivocally, but just to go against that a little bit, I'm going to say no, and I, I actually believe that. I think we had this conversation before. I believe that was my answer then, uh, and I'm going to stick with that. It's going to be my answer now as well. I think that they're going to stay up, and I know I, I can't see Graham. I have my notes pulled up, and I'm sure he's making a face at me right now. Um, nonetheless, I think that they're a better team than the bottom three. So Luton Town, Sheffield United, and Bournemouth, I think, are all worse than Everton. Now, it's hard to say that, being that they've struggled with uh, results against the bottom three teams that I just mentioned. Uh, they lost to Luton Town. They drew with Sheffield United, I believe it was. Um, but nonetheless, they've been in this situation many, many times before, as we know. They've been so close to being relegated when they've done just enough to stay up. I think they will do it again. I do think we need to see more, though, from Calvert-Lewin. I think he needs to play better at striker. Currently, he has only two goals. Um, so if he can produce just a little bit more that will help this Everton team that is struggling on offense. But Jordan Pickford has actually been okay at goalkeeper. Uh, he's played 14 games, given up 19 goals. His goal against average is 1.56, which isn't the worst. The save percentage is pretty bad at 6.57. That's pretty low. But the goal against average is is not the worst, and I think that they can improve at least a little bit, and a little bit, which will be enough to stay up in the Premier League. Joey, what do you think? Yeah, I don't know if they're ringing the alarm bells too crazy just yet. I mean, you got to be scared seven points in in nine games. But I kind of want to flip things to the other side, talk about Liverpool a bit. Finally, you see Mohamed Salah playing Mohamed Salah football. You see him getting those goals, carrying that Liverpool team. But I think you're happy where you are right now as a Liverpool fan. You're only three points out of the top spot. And uh, after a shaky season last year, I mean, where you are now is awesome. But yeah, back to Everton. Yeah, I want to see some players step up. I know Deli Alley's had a very troubled career, and we can go on and on about where he's been and what happened to him, but he has, he has to be a leader at that team now, and I think you're going to see it play up a bit more. But yeah, I think there's a lot of teams that are pretty solid in the bottom of the standings there. I mean, like you said, Luton Town, Sheffield, United, Burnmouth, but also you got Burnley down there in the mix as well. These are teams that, they're Premier League teams, but they're teams that you see going up and down a lot. Everton is not a team you see it going up and down that much. Yeah, and, you know, it's funny because me and Louis had just talked about on last episode the consistency that refs need to have with handing out these red cards and handing out these yellow cards and, you know, trying to keep 11 players in the field, which seems to be their objective, yet they send off um, an Everton player in this game, another red card, which we're going to get into later because, you know, it seems to be a problem this season. But, you know, a, a double yellow card, which I think rightly so should be a double yellow card. I think on Everton's point, like to Liverpool's point, they were both double yellow, like they were both yellow cards. He brought them down in, in an attacking position. It's definitely a yellow card, the second one and the first one. But then Kanate does the same exact thing. So Kanate brings him down and he gets subbed off immediately after because Klopp's not trying to risk him getting sent off after the first yellow. And he does the same exact foul. So why, why aren't these 
what's with the inconsistency? Is there like favoritism toward Liverpool in this? Because it seems like it. It seemed like it in this game because Sean Dyche was very adamant about it. Yeah, so I mean, <laughs> it's hard to say. There's always these conspiracies and whatnot about, oh, they're favoring these top five teams, or oh, Liverpool has got the money in this system, whatever you want to talk about. But I think it's, I think you want to talk about consistency. I think it's been consistently harsh this season. The cards have been flying like nuts. And I think that was another situation where, yes, these were all yellow card offenses. I think in previous years in this league, you get away with a lot, especially in the Premier League. And I think they're trying to crack down on things. You saw with the World Cup how they are making the extra time longer. They're trying to actually enforce the rule book a bit heavier. And I don't know if that's translating to the Premier League season and how they want it to, but you are seeing a lot of red cards, a lot of yellow card offenses that sometimes, especially early in the games, I mean, 37th minute red card, early on in these games, you used to be able to do anything to the other team. Like You could get in so much trouble and you're going to get some warnings here and there, but usually you don't see any cards flying until like the 20th, 25th minute, let alone a red card in the 37th. And I was going to say real quick, Graham, uh, let me jump in here, uh, that perhaps EAFC got it right because it seems like every foul you commit in that video yeah, game is so an immediate off. red card. Um, I guess it reflects the Premier League pretty well in that case. Uh, but to your point, Joey, that you made towards the end there, I think that they're being stricter in the first portion of games. Because as you mentioned, I, rem I can remember watching games, Premier League games, um, where players would commit pretty harsh fouls and they, they would only be given a free kick. There are no cards shown. So I think that's part of it is that they're getting on players earlier. They're, they're being probably just harsher overall in the rules, but definitely in those first few minutes of play. And I think that's leading to more red cards and also more yellow cards being shown this season. Yes, I definitely think we're going to definitely talk about this a little bit more in the detail because it seems to be maybe a problem, maybe not. It really depends on how you want to look at it. But we're going to be moving on to a game with no red cards shown, thankfully, because it would have been very disappointing to have any red cards shown in such a big match like the London Derby between Chelsea and Arsenal this weekend. The game finished a 2-2 draw with Arsenal scoring two late goals after Chelsea went up 2-0 very early on in this game. So what I want to ask is, Arsenal fans are honestly should not be happy with this result, especially with the way Chelsea have been playing. And Chelsea fans, I think, are a little hasty here and there. And I'm the point that, you know, yes, it was a very good game and we saw a lot of improvement from Chelsea, but we probably should have still won that game being up 2-0. So we're going to look into this game. And how do you think that this is maybe a little bit of a turning point for Chelsea being able to compete with the team who is obviously a title contender this season? Graham, you bring up a good point, like in that Arsenal should not be happy with the win or with the draw. I mean, but being that they were down too, I mean, there is something to be said for that. Um, yes, Chelsea was like the better team for the most part of that game. And yes, Chelsea probably should have won that game. Uh, but on the other side, looking at Arsenal, um, they should not be in a position to where they're drawing to Chelsea. Like I would assume Ryan Johnson, if he was here, would be calling for a, a Chelsea W there. But I mean, it, it still shows resiliency and it still shows that they're able to to fight back from being down 0-2. Yeah, I think it's a tale of two teams that Chelsea couldn't lock it up at the end and then Arsenal shouldn't have been in that position in the first place with how they've been playing this season. Now, I have a long history with Chelsea. I, I like them. I don't like them. I'm I'm really a guy who follows a lot of Americans. I just follow Americans wherever they go. And when Pulisic went to Chelsea, it was a very exciting move for me as a fan of American soccer. And seeing him do well and then fall backwards and everything going on and the team just spending a lot, a lot of money. I have a very interesting relationship with the Chelsea Football Club. And uh, I've kind of been rooting against them in recent, in recent history. Uh, and, you know, I thought... This was kind of, you were saying, it was kind of a turning point. They showed some resiliency that I don't think you saw there for a while. And they showed some heart. And I know I, I don't like Conor Gallagher. I don't know how I'm big on, uh, on uh, Palmer. But I did like how they played. And you finally got Merdrick going a little bit there, too. So, you know, as much as I'm, I'm not a fan of Chelsea, 
I like seeing that they're taking steps in the right direction. And as though you don't get the win, you can't walk it up at the end there. I think from my outsider perspective, as a Chelsea fan, you're not happy with that because you couldn't lock it down. But also, you're not angry, angry because you're showing good signs of playing good soccer. Yeah, I mean, okay, I'm going to take what you said about two players there. And <laughs> I think you were just have just been drastically undermining the fact that one, Connor Gallagher has been a Chelsea boy his entire career. He started his career at Chelsea at, the, at a very young age and has been playing through the system and, and is now the captain of Chelsea with Reese James out being injured. He is captaining this team, which has got to be a dream for him. And he has been very, I think he's undroppable. I think he's one of the only players in our squad that is undroppable because he has just been critical in winning those midfield battles and really progressing the ball forward with the absence of Christopher and Kunku. He's kind of been filling in a little bit in that more progressive 10 slot and really been pushing the ball forward. And he he might not be the most skillful player. You don't you don't see that. But he is a guy who does wear Chelsea on his heart. And he goes out there and puts in as best of a performance that he can for the club. And I think that's highly undervalued. And also, and Cole Palmer, I think we've ripped off Man City there. I think Cole Palmer, I honestly think it's going to be something Man City in the future will end up regretting because this kid's been amazing. He slows the game down to his own pace. He plays those critical balls. That left foot of his is just absolutely wicked. And now we have a consistent penalty taker because his last two penalties have been given to Cole Palmer. Yes, maybe the first one was kind of like a, you know, give him this penalty so that he can score and then, you know, he can get, build his confidence and get a Chelsea goal, get that out of the way because that seems to be a big thing. Like, if you don't score a certain number of games for Chelsea, you're terrible or whatever. But, you know, he's gotten two penalties. He's saying to him, he's a young kid and he's really looking to just get the minutes that he wasn't going to get at Man City and he found them at our club. And I think, honestly, it's just something that Man City is going to end up missing or maybe a little bit regretting in the end, especially for the fact that they only sold him to us for around $60 million, which is, you know, not the heftiest price tag in today's market. But we're going to move on to Cole Palmer's old club, Manchester City, who, like me and Louis talked about, has been under a little bit of scrutiny from the media. And I don't think they've really proved the media too wrong this weekend, scraping by Brighton in a 2-1 win while one of them also, uh, well, they fell to uh, victim to another red card, like we have been mentioning over and over. It's very much been a problem this season, but they are falling from grace, as people are saying, and they still maintain second in the Premier League at the time. So, you know, is the criticism still fair? Are we going to still hold true to these people, who, to these pundits who are saying that Manchester City has fallen off significantly, or is it just, are they just too good? I mean, I feel like it makes sense that we criticize the media and then they criticize Man City after a win. Like it, I don't know. I, I like that they still won. Like they scored more goals than Brighton. Sure, Brighton is not the best of of Premier League sides, and they probably could have won by more than one goal. But I feel like as long as Manchester City is winning, then they're doing good. Like yes, they might have fallen off because they had a historic season last year. Well, with, with a historic player last year, but still, like they won. If they lost, I think the conversation could certainly be shifted. Um, it certainly could be a little bit different then, because then you actually would ask genuine questions about if does this team fall off? Brighton's not that good, but they didn't. They won. I know. I know they squeaked by. It wasn't the best game for Man City by any means, but they were able to grind it out uh, and get a W against, I, I don't know where they are on the table. I think they're like either nine or 10. Um, so they're either t middle to like top 10 in the table against Brighton. So I, I think they're going to be fine going forward. Again, I think it's partially because the, the media would like a story to that. The, they like to spin a story kind of like what I was talking about yesterday with my Wayne Rooney book. They kind of would like to, to spin the story in a way in which that they can get people to be like, oh, either. Yeah, yes, I agree. Man City is falling off or like, oh, there's no way they're falling off. And then they go ahead and click on the story. Um, I think they're going to be just fine. I mean, I guess we'll see. You have to see how it plays out. But. Uh, I mean, well, Joey, what do you think? Yeah, also, don't be discounting my junkyard dogs out of Brighton. I mean, they're... I like they're, Brighton. I know yeah. I like Brighton. That's what I'm saying. Like, Brighton's a the, decent team. Like, Brighton's like, seventh right now. Yes, they fall victim to the right. occasional 7-1 okay. loss here and there, but <laughs> to Aston well, Villa, well, but, that was you know... I don't know why they do that. They're a very good team, and occasionally they just get absolutely murdered, but Joey continues. <laughs> yeah, in recent history, Brighton's been consistently a very good Premier League team. They've just been going up. Yeah, it, it, you should have been investing a few years ago because the stock's already up. 
because this team is good. And I don't know why it's like, oh, Man City, they only they barely beat Brighton. Like you said, Louis, win's a win. But also, right. Brighton is a top 10 Premier League team. That's a team that should give Man City a run for their money a little bit. And, you know, Ansu Fati, I'm a big Barcelona guy, too. They're my team out in Spain. Love that, seeing him succeed on loan there. But, yeah, at Man City, you know, everyone's going to say if they're not in first place by a mile that they're going to that they're falling off. It's because that's just what people expect from a team coached by Pep Guardiola, but also what they expect from a team with that stacked of, of a player lineup. You also have to realize everyone is complaining about it after this week. It was just international break. They're playing during the week, and then some players come back from South America all the way back to Europe playing on Sunday or Saturday. And then some teams have Champions League games in the middle of this week. So, you know, oh, yeah, they're spread thin, whatever. That It's Man City. It's too early. It's nine games in this season. They're they're out by, like, what, one or two points? Like, come on. what? This is a ridiculous narrative people are pushing. Now, there is one thing that Louis had mentioned in the last episode, and that part of the reason Man City might be struggling a little bit more than usual is the lack of Kevin De Bruyne being in the lineup and him being such a critical part of this lineup. And rumors have come out recently, especially today, that um, – he is looking to, for a move to Saudi Arabia. His agents have been in contact with Saudi Arabian clubs recently. And he was at UFC 294 during the Manchester City and Brighton game. Now, yes, he is injured. But do you really want that kind of, you know, these this player is being linked. And sure, it's his agents who are talking, not him directly, to these Saudi Arabian clubs while in the middle of a season, not even in the middle of a transfer window, and him not attending these games or at least like staying home and watching them going out to a UFC event, you know, which is, you know, not the best look maybe. How do you guys feel about that? That's really sad. I actually didn't know that. And that's really unfortunate because I feel like, well, okay. One, like, I feel like a lot of players are linked to a Saudi move because like they just have so much money and can want to get their hands on as many good players as possible. So there's like, I think it's to be taken with a grain of salt. But the fact that he wasn't at the game is big. I did not know that. Um, so that that is a kind of shocking to me because it, it would be kind of sad to see someone who is so good and has been so good in the Premier League for so long, not quite throw it all away, but just like disregard that and then make a move for money to the Saudi League after he's built so, so much in the Premier League. I mean, I guess that kind of goes both ways because you can make the argument that, oh, he's been so good for so long, might as well go and get the bag. I understand that. But to... Like, hopefully this doesn't keep happening because, like, it would be kind of a sign of KDB giving up on either the season or the team or the or, or Pep or Holland or someone. Something in there is going wrong for him wanting to go to UFC rather than being at the game. I mean, perhaps he got excused, but I don't, I don't think that that is the case. So I, I hope that, you know, it, it doesn't end poorly for either City or De Bruyne because, one, I like them. But, like, I like De Bruyne. I don't like the City as a team. But oh, uh, aside from that, uh, it just it just would be sad to see as like a football fan in general to see this break down in that kind of manner that you're describing. Yeah, no matter which way you spin it, it's not a great look um, for De Bruyne, for Man City, even if he does get a special pass to go to that. It's like, well, why is he getting this special treatment? Yes, he's Kevin De Bruyne, but also that's part of that team mentality. You're just one of the one of the guys on the team. Um, so it's interesting to see what happens with that. Also, a Saudi Arabia move, you know, I could see anybody going there at any time because they're they're just paying an insane amount of money. It's hard to say no to like, oh, you're making this much money. What if you got offered to play do your job, but for four times the amount of money you're doing it right now? It's like, oh, okay, I'll go do that for a couple of years, and then like maybe I'll move back. But it's like, it's hard to say no to these contracts, and that's why it's a hard conversation. Because it sucks for us as soccer fans in the overall game of soccer, but also it's hard to blame some of those players. Yeah, and I'm going to make one last point there. Like, like I we had again. Like, I feel like a lot of this episode has kind of been like these things that are kind of been reoccurring that we have talked about in like the last previous episodes of the season. That these things, different situations seem to kind of be reoccurring with different teams, and it's you know, interesting. But like I said, mentioned previously that knowing that Wake had been suspended for a few games by Mauricio Pochettino. He'd been, brought, he'd been dropped because he went out while he was injured. I would equivalent this to the same thing. You know, going to a UFC event is obviously 
you know, not going to be something that is relaxing and, you know, is appropriate to be doing while injured and away from the squad. So you see things like that. And I know I've watched Pep Guardiola throughout his career and I've watched documentaries on him. He does not seem like the type of guy who really would be like very allowing of something like this. He's always been very serious about how his players act and the way they act off the field and on the field. So, you know, I don't know how to exactly feel about this. I feel like Kevin DeBrenna isn't really one to do something like this, especially in the past. He's kind of shied away a little bit from media extravaganzas, which he, you know, has been at the center of, but not because of him in the past. And, you know, I feel like that this something that just seems a little bit out of character for him, a little like, you know, especially for the quiet Kevin DeBrenna that we know. But we're going to move on to something that, is not normal for this podcast. We usually only talk about the top leagues here, and we're going to do anything but that for the next few minutes. And we're going to send it over to Joey, the specialist on the most interesting teams that he likes and that he feels about in football because interesting is the only word that can be used to describe the teams he likes. And I'm very excited to hear about it. So, Joey, why don't you take it away? Yeah, I really appreciate you giving me a platform here to talk about the crazy teams I like. But first, I want to stay a little local. We are Seton Hall, we're, so we're South Orange, New Jersey, we're in that North Jersey area. The New York Red Bulls, who play in Harris, New Jersey, just made a playoff berth. Their 14th consecutive season making the playoffs. And by the way, them in decision day was the only week the entire season that they were above the playoff line. So they barely made it in. They had some troubles with their coach at the beginning of the year. Their coach actually left the team. They had Troy Lassen come in, take over the team. I think they only had like a few points after two months in the season. It was looking grim for Red Bulls fans. Lassen rallied everybody. He started playing a younger lineup. He had guys like Daniel Edelman, Frankie Amaya, really putting a lot of work in and getting them above that playoff line. It's really cool to see them make it pay off at the end with a 94th minute PK from John Tolkien to make them into the playoffs. They are playing t- uh, Wednesday, the 25th. So the day after we're recording this in the first round of the playoffs against Charlotte. Now, real quick, before you go into anything else, Joey, do you want to give a little shout out to your Red Bulls podcast that you guys have at WSOU? Yeah, yeah, of course. So at WSC, you can actually hear Louie on a few episodes. Uh, we have Bulls on Parade, which is all about the New York Red Bulls. It's cool that with WSU, we get to go to those games. We get to go to the locker room, interview some of the players afterwards, get to go to the coaches' press conference as well. And so, yeah, really cool opportunity that we have there. Also, staying at Red Bull Arena on the women's side of things, the NWSL Gotham FC are in the semifinals of the NWSL playoffs right now. So they won their first round of the playoffs. And a huge shout out to Allie Krieger, who was a rock solid in the back at center back, pretty much pushed them to that win. And so now they are performing the semifinal. Unfortunately, there's no home field advantage for the NWSL playoffs. They're all at neutral locations. And so we won't be able to revert them on at Red Bull Arena. But now we move on a little bit less local to where teams I'm really passionate about. Um, so I got my Fiorentina jersey on. We won't talk about Syria because that's talking about the big leagues. We're going to talk about Syria B, which has my team, Venezia, in it, um, who plays in Venice. But what's really important about that team is that they have two American players on their team. Gianluca Busio, a player who played in the Sporting KC camp, I think is the third youngest MLS player to play and make his debut, third or fourth. He's in there as one of the youngest players to play in the MLS. He's still very young and has made a few U.S. men's national team caps, but he is on Venezia along with Tanner Tessman, both controlling the midfield. Tessman is out with injury for a little bit, but both of them playing very good. Tessman coming, becoming somewhat of a free kick specialist for Venezia. Scored a few goals off some nasty free kicks. They're to watch out for because they are sitting at fourth place in Serie B. They got relegated, I believe, two years ago. So they're trying to get promoted back into Serie A. And I would imagine that Busio and Tessman stay on that team if they get promoted. And if they don't get promoted, I could see them making it a move up to some higher leagues. No, I have a question about Serie B because we have seen some very good players come out of there. Jorginho, a Chelsea, former Chelsea player, being one of those players that, you know, you can highlight. How would you describe Serie B to someone who, like, you know, doesn't watch it too much like myself? Like, would you compare it to something like the championship, a developmental kind of league? Or would you compare it to, like, a low-level league where, you know, you're not really going to grow too much out of it? 
it's interesting because I think it's pretty polarizing. The teams at the bottom of Serie B aren't that great. <laughs> um, but it's not like... I would compare it, I think actually it's better than the Spanish second division. Because you have teams like Parma, you have Palermo, you have um, Sampdoria, Spieza, all teams that are in and out of Serie A, Cremonese even. These teams go in and out of uh, Serie A. And a lot of times there's actually a lot of controversy in Italian football that prevents these teams from doing a lot of things. So a lot of betting going on, a lot of gambling. Those Italians. is very good and it's very competitive venezia stadium is a, i actually got to see it in person um i was in venice this summer unfortunately i didn't get to see a game but i got to see the empty stadium it's a beautiful stadium they pretty much fill it week in week out and the play is pretty italian pretty defensive you see a lot of guys that are um masterminds of the ball masterminds of controlling play it's a it's a slower paced game it's very tactical but it's what you would expect out of an italian league that has a lot of italian nationals playing in it and it's really cool to see busio and tessman succeeding in that style because when they come to the national team you see tessman he had one cap and busio has had a bunch now where they bring that Italian style of play where they like to slow things down, they control it, they are pinpointing passes like nobody else. Busio came in more as a right mid, right winger for the men's national team and is now playing more of a center defensive mid role because he's just adopted that Italian style of play. Now, but Joey, real quick. So there, there are different parameters surrounding the different like second leagues and nations how big is the italian second league serie b and also how many teams get promoted how many teams get relegated um i believe it's so it's interesting because serie b works like regular but the third division of italy is actually split up into two separate leagues and so i believe it's a uh, three-team relegation and a three-team promotion system like usual though and it's um a top two in a playoff like it is in the england uh, lower divisions and while we're talking about England lower division, let's talk about <laughs> oh, let's talk about my segment. team. Let's talk about my team AFC Wimbledon here. Uh, up the Dons, there's nobody else like them. AFC Wimbledon is a team that was uh, dispersed because they were bought out by the franchise currently plying its trade in Milton Keynes. Nothing dons about them. They were relocated, and the Football Association said that there's no interest and having a football team in Wimbledon at this moment. So what did the fans of ASC Wimbledon do? They held an open public tryout at Wimbledon Common, which is a small park in, in Wimbledon. And they started in the eighth division and got promoted a bunch of times in 10 years and made it back into professional football that is in League Four. And they are something of a wonder's tale wonder tale uh, the author john green wrote the fault on our stars turtles all the way down a bunch of other things uh it has a major um stake not financially well he puts a lot of financial in it but he actually owns the same amount of the team as i do which is one share and it's an all fan owned club and it's really cool and so they're my team they actually have a very good striker who is almost poached at the summer transfer window his name's ali alhamdi he is an iraqi national he plays for the iraq national team and they are very good under there in that middle eastern um in the middle eastern football world the national scene is growing kind of like the north american one is too and it's interesting to see a player like ali alhamdi in the fourth division of England, you don't see many guys get call-ups to national teams all the way down there. But when it's a different quality of soccer, it's cool to see Al Hamdi getting those minutes. And Wimbledon actually lost today against Accrington Stanley. The, the best, the best team names are in these lower divisions, by the way. There's there's Gillingham, there's the Morecambe Shrimps, there's Swindon Town. I mean, it, it's all amazing. And so they lost to Accrington Stanley today, 4-2. to two, So that puts them down in the 10th place, but they are not far away. They're only two points out of a playoff position. So I'm rooting for my Dons in that fourth division. You know, I can uh, speak to AFC Wimbledon and the quality of their football because Chelsea did play them in the first round of the Carabao Cup for Chelsea this year, which, you know, honestly, they gave us way better of a game than, you know, you would expect a fourth 
a, a division team like AFC Wimbledon to do. But I was honestly very impressed. I think that, you know, I love the fan owned teams, the local teams. I'm glad that you own as much that you personally own as much as the guy who owns the most amount of stake and puts the most amount into the club, which I think is just, you know, I, I think with the grassroots team and seeing them succeed is just awesome. Kind of like what you see with Wrexham, even though like a majority share owner owns them and everything, but you know, a club resurrected, a club that once was, you know, a bigger club that was, you know, kind of hampered down financially over the years, kind of like Wrexham, just, you know, be able to rise back up. So I'm interested. I always wondered this is so MK Dons is the original AFC Wimbledon, correct? Yeah, so there used to be Wimbledon FC, which was the team that turned into uh, MK Milton Keynes. I, I will never say Dons when referring to them. I'll say, oh, maybe <laughs> I'll say, maybe I'll say MK. Maybe I'll say Milton Keynes. A lot of people say the franchise, but there is nothing Dons about them. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's interesting because it's cool because I was a fan, as most people who like soccer and. When I heard about the Wrexham documentary, I'm like, oh, this is as weird and as cool as it gets. They're following a fifth division team uh, trying to get up there. They're in the same division as Wimbledon right now. And I, I, I like both teams. I'm rooting for both teams. But when it's Wimbledon versus Wrexham, you know I'm back in Wimbledon. And Wimbledon, when they played Chelsea, that was a, a three to two game. That was insane. Um, g- gave them a lot more of a run for their money. Or sorry, two to one. When they played uh, back in 2014, it was three to two. Um, the two to one game. But I think Wimbledon was up for a br- very brief time, and the-, the Chelsea fans were shaken. But then Chelsea made a few substitutions, and that was kind of over. <laughs> I have to give it to you though. Like, I mean, and you did allow Enzo Fernandez to score his first goal for Chelsea. Yeah, so, that's right. Know, I feel it right here for <laughs> AFC Wimbledon. You know, and. I think that I love the fact that you have this, you know, niche almost knowledge of football, which not a lot of people have. The only people that you would expect an AFC Wimbledon supporter supporter to be is in Wimbledon, like support, like in the stadium every Sunday at three o'clock, rooting their team on against its wind in town and against the shrimps. I didn't I picked up on that one, but you know, I just love the fact that you love these little niche teams. Um, that you don't hear about and the fact that you get to give them a little bit of a platform on here. Honestly, we should be marketing this toward AFC Wimbledon fans because mm-hmm. when did their show, when did their team ever get talked about on a podcast? I think it's, I think it's only right that their team should be talked about on a podcast. Now, maybe is this the biggest podcast? Not by any means, but you know, it's coverage and we love to hear about the nor niche things, especially here in America when you only really hear about the big teams. And I think that's just awesome. Yeah, I really appreciate you having me on here, too. I mean, I could talk. I follow a lot more teams than this, but I, I'm not going to go on too much longer. Um, but I just really appreciate you guys having me on here. And yeah, when it comes to, to liking weird stuff in sports, I'm all about it. And because it's, it's all about stories. I mean, that's what that's what it is. And John Green actually talks about um, AFC Wimbledon in, in a very nice way. He says football is like watching theater. And if your team wins, it's a comedy. And if they lose, it's a tragedy. And But it's really all about the theater and the theatrics. And especially in those lower divisions, like, you know, when Wimbledon plays Milton Keynes, there's th- people are killing each other. Like, not literally, hopefully. Uh, there's been a, a lot of hooliganism, as they call it, some fights that break out at the matches. But, like, when it's guys that play for the Wimbledon Youth Academy and have gone up their whole life, they saw their team get bought by that franchise, and then they're on that field playing against them in the fourth division, which, by the way, Milton Keynes sitting at 16th, where A. Wimbledon sitting at 10th right now. So, you know, how'd that go for you? Hubris. I like it. Yeah, how'd that go for you? And, um, but you really see it, and that's what you love. I mean, Watching AFC Wimbledon a bunch of years ago upset uh, West Ham in the FA Cup is one of the coolest moments ever, and that was at a Wimbledon home game, and that was one of the few games. So I don't get to watch a lot of these games. That was actually on ESPN+. Plus. That was so cool seeing that. (laughs) Um, But really, it's all about, like, the storylines and, like, the interactions of the people that go on between it and the people on the field. So that's that's what I really like, and I also like following the Americans abroad, too. 
And Joey, I'm sure we'll have you back talking about the various teams that you follow, the various <laughs> Americans that are placed all throughout the world in the soccer world. But thank you again for stopping by. Yeah, thank yes. you so much for having me on. Of course, Joey. Anything for a fellow Wyoming Valley Conference guy like yourself, like ourselves here. Sorry, Lewis, we're leaving you out of it a little bit, but you know, we're all we all talk soccer here. And thank you so much for coming out here. Don't forget to check out Joey's podcast about the Red Bulls and to check out WSOU in general. We love those guys over there. A lot of them intermingle with us here over at PTV. But I think that's gonna wrap it up for this episode. Thank you guys so much for watching, and we'll see you guys next time. I think we need to rebrand.